What's going on, guys? Since Prepper Live, we're going to be talking about the inch bag versus the dugout bag. And there's some important differences. And so we're going to go through some things to think about. Um, and we really appreciate Sarah Mack. She's over on the computer monitoring questions, taking questions. If you have something, you can put those down at any time. And when we take a break, then uh, we'll try to answer those questions. Also, Robbie Wheaton's um, on vacation this week, so he will not be here. It's just going to be me. <laughs> so, um, and also, we really appreciate Exotat. Uh, they sponsor the channel. We have uh, a number of different fire tools that they offer. Uh, we're going to get into a little bit about why certain ones are more important for an inch bag than others. Uh, but you get 20% off using Such 20. Having a fire kit is vital for your get home bag, bug out bag, inch bag. Uh, and so with that being said, let's get right into it. I, I think one of the things about the inch bag, and it's always been a little bit of a mystery, what's the difference between an inch bag and a bug out bag? I mean, you got your bug out bag and, you know, it's full of stuff and, you know, you can't really get anything in it else in it. Uh, and to be honest with you, if you're going to bug out, you need to really bug out in a vehicle with a giant trailer on the back and then you make yourself vulnerable <laughs> Bugging out is never a good idea unless it's a the only, only choice because you are a glorified refugee. So now we're going to go a step farther, and this is going to put you in really more vulnerable. But it's important to take a look at the inch bag, which the um, acronym for inch is I'm never coming home. Now, you may say, I've got my bug out bag. I'm going to put it on my back and I'm going to go and I'm not necessarily coming back home. I'm going to my brother-in-law's. <laughs> and But you're going somewhere where you can resupply. Typically, a bug out bag is a 72-hour bag. That means you've got the, enough supplies in here to take care of you and your family and not just your family should each have a bug out bag. Don't think that you've got the bag with everything in it, especially if you have a family with a couple of kids or uh, you know, you've got maybe elderly, you've got somebody with you. Uh, you Each one needs to have their own supplies. Now, they may not be able to carry as much and you may be taking the bigger share of the load. But it's very important to make sure that your wife, uh, even your kids, have some sort of necessary survival items in their bag and they can distribute the load a little bit. But the 72 hour bag is not going to do you any good if you have to leave an area. Now, what are we talking about? And of course, guys, you know, a lot of times we look at the world today and we try to figure out what's going to happen, how it's going to work. Oh, that'll never happen. But over history, over the history of mankind, there have been times where an inch bag was what they had, whether they knew it or not, that they were leaving. The fall of the Roman Empire is a prime example you know, that they just had to leave. World War II. I mean, people, their homes were just completely destroyed. Their whole communities, towns, uh, in the middle of a battle. And people were really not necessarily bugging out as much as they were never coming home again. And once they did relocate, it could be years. It could be a long period of time. It could be months, years. So three days is not going to get you there. So what is the what is the deal? Um, first off, you, know, you can look at homeless. Let's just think about homeless. We did a video talking about lessons, survival lessons to be learned by the homeless. Uh, obviously, they're, they're not coming home because they don't have a home. They have no place. Uh, but, you know, a lot of times with uh, homeless, they live in areas where there is a population, where there is some support, where there are food banks, where there are places they can get um, uh, meals uh, and a lot of times even shelter. Uh, but really, overall, they're kind of on their own. And really, the close when it, when you comes to an inch bag, you're closer to just being homeless. Uh, I thought it was very um, enlightening when I did the study on the homeless, and um, and and figuring out the lessons that could be learned there, and that a lot of times homeless are living in their cars or living in a tent somewhere, and they're actually working a job, and you don't even know it. You don't even know that those people are homeless. Uh, a lot of women. I think 20% of homeless are single women that, you know, for different reasons had to leave. Maybe it was an abusive relationship. Maybe they didn't have family close by and they just left their home. And then they found themselves living among the homeless. Uh, 
and becoming homeless. So this is really a, a, a thought process of you are homeless. So how are you going to take it up a notch? How are you going to be able to stand it? Uh, first off is, you know, again, with groups, you have um, you, you have your bag. I've got my bag. I've got it going. Um, you know, one thing that we try to do is each of our family members, each of my family members have a bag in their vehicle. Uh, we just went on a little trip down to Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, went to see Jordan Peterson. It was a great, great trip. But whenever I go out of town like that, I always have a what I call my get home bag in the car. And, and my wife had her get home bag in the car. We like to kind of, you know, booster it up a little bit, have some supplies just in case. Because here's the thing, guys, you never know what could possibly happen. The fact is, is having a bug out bag, a get home bag, whatever, in your vehicle doesn't take up a lot of room. And so you can leave it in there for years. Hopefully uh, you will never have to use it. But uh, in the world we live in and the way things have happened over history, there is a possibility that you could at some point. Uh, nuclear exchange uh, or, you know, devastation or a fire coming through. I know the people in Western or in uh, the Western part of the country have dealt with a lot of fires, wildfires that have burned up huge communities. Uh, a lot of times you do have support that comes in, but there is possibilities where there's other things going on and you may not get that support. And so, again, maybe this is just an exercise for you to think through. What I'll say is we're going to go through kind of the philosophy. We're going to look at a few things. We're not going to talk about all the contents in the inch bag at this point because we're doing a full review, building an inch bag from the ground up and going through each of the, the reasons why we have it. Here, we're just going to discuss some of the thoughts and some things that you might consider putting together an inch bag. You have your bug out bag or maybe you don't have a bug out bag. It would be a good um, idea to put together a bug out bag. Even FEMA, and we talked about FEMA last week, even FEMA recommends having some kind of container full of uh, very important survival items if you have to evacuate where you are. So this isn't just some pie in the sky survivalist mindset. This is even from our U.S. government says, hey, guys, you need to think about some pre preparations. Uh, you don't have to go to doomsday preppers, but you need to think about some things. So when we're talking about, uh, first off, a group, you need to have a group. You need to think about the people that are with you. Uh, the groups are great. Think about it this way. You know, a lot of people say, well, I'm going to put my bug out bag on. If, if things happen, maybe my house gets overrun by zombies or whatever, and you're heading out to the woods, which is a bad idea, number one. But you really should have some sort of destination. Uh, the one thing about the inch bag is you're not necessarily going to have a destination. Um, you know, if something were to occur, you lost your home and uh, you're, you're, you know, there was an EMP or something like that. That's where an inch bag is really going to be vital. Uh, you may not be able to leave your home. I mean, for us, my parents live uh, next door to us. They're in their 80s. It's not like they're going to get on a, a trail and go for days, you know, in, in a bug out situation. But strength in numbers. Uh, secondly, think about the area. Are you going to be in an urban area or a suburban area or outside of a town where you're trying to live and survive uh, while you're going through whatever situation you're going through? Uh, you know, those are important because there are different things that you have to consider in an urban situation versus a, um, a rural situation. Uh, and then uh, what about weather conditions? Now, Let's say I head out in the early spring or maybe late summer and something happens and I've got my inch bag and I'm heading out. Well, winter and fall and winter are coming. So am I going to be able to get settled in somewhere before to be able to, you know, to adapt to where I am? And do I have a coat? Yeah, it's warm right now. But what about next month? Is that going to be warm? And of course, right now you can't tell. you wake up in the morning, it's freezing. The afternoon is hot. Uh, so, uh, you know, even the American Indians are a great example of living off the land. Uh, you know, the thing is, is a lot of times we have these pipe dreams that we're just going to go and live off the land and we're, we can just go out into the woods and we can hunt and fish and, and do all that. But the one thing about the Indians were it was a tough life, but they had the culture, they had the skill and they had been doing this and they had a group mentality that all of these people are adept in the culture of the uh, Native American Indians. And so really, you're going to have to have some support unless you are a, you know, Delta Recon 
<laughs> SEAL, sniper, whatever. Uh, and even then, they have to have support. Uh, okay, so first thing we want to consider is our shelter. You got to have some kind of shelter. Uh, you know, you can live three hours in harsh, extreme harsh conditions. Uh, you need to have shelter. So typically, I would consider having a tent of some sort, hammock, something that I could sleep in that would protect me from the, the elements. Uh, and having some sort of a sleeping bag or something that I can sleep in. But, but this is one thing about all of these different items. With a bug out bag, you can get by with um, not necessarily super sturdy items. I mean, there are items that, you know, that you can use for three, four or five days, even a week. And you can use them like crazy. But, you know, over time, they're just going to disintegrate. And so you need to think about in each of the things that you put in your bag, they have to be durable. Not plastic containers, but metal containers metal, you know, forks and utensils, things like that, uh, having those ready to go because, again, it's that's what you have and you may not be able to get something else. Um, so um, but also and this is one thing we covered a while back was just shelters, abandoned shelters. Uh, you can we can go down our road down here and there are houses or old barns or there are businesses that have been just abandoned where you know, they're no longer really serviceable. It's going to cost more to fix them up than to uh, to use them. And so a lot of times they're just abandoned. And so you can find places like that uh, that you may have to hold up. Now, obviously, you know, you could be trespassing against the law. And the one thing, and I've, and I've said this a number of times in, in Argentina when they had their collapse, is the police are not there to save you, but they're there to arrest you. So you want to be careful uh, with continuing to obey laws. Uh, they may be tied up, they may be busy, but you may have a run in and you don't want to end up, you know, against the law or in jail. So um, shelter is vital. And so planning out your sleep system for not again, just you, but your whole family, uh, even if you are in an abandoned building and it gets down to 20, 30 degrees, uh, you know, you're going to be cold and could actually freeze to death. So you want to make sure you have some insulation, which also goes to what kind of clothing you're going to have. Uh, First off is you want to have some extra clothes So uh, because clothes wear out. Even on a daily basis, you're wearing it every day, sooner or later, but you're out in the elements, you're going to put a lot of wear and tear on your clothing. Uh, but picking out clothing that is somewhat subdued, it doesn't have to be camouflage, but it can be colors that seem to blend in a little bit. Um, also, you know, a good pair of shoes. Uh, one thing about that in particular is a pair of shoes that will last you a long time. And there are some really expensive shoes out there that will go and go and go. Uh, but there are also today what we typically do is we buy shoes and we're not thinking about the durability. We're thinking about the way they look. So having a good pair of sturdy shoes that are going to last uh, for months. And so and then rain gear. Rain gear is very important. Uh, making sure that you have something to protect yourself from the rain. Uh, OK, so shelter. That's one of the things that's it's a basis. Uh, then we have our fire tools. Now, fire tools are very important, uh, but I'll tell you what, matches, forget it. Bic lighter, forget it. I had a guy make a comment about Bic lighters, and he said, the Bic lighters go forever. I'm sorry, but there's only a limited amount of fuel in here, and this striker gets caught, and, you know, it, it's not a, a long-term, sustainable type uh, way to create fire. So, for me, one thing that I like to use are fair cerium rods. Uh, they 10,000 strikes. That gives me a lot of fire capability. Uh, and so strikers or, you know, even like um, the uh, the ones that just strike the wheel that, ha that create a spark. You know, that's great. That takes a little bit more to create a fire. But there's a number of different type strikers and, and ferrocerium rods that are out there. You know, you can even go again to your standard, uh, you know, um, whatever this is, <laughs> this striker with the... Uh, um, yeah, that. I don't know why my brain's not working. Um, somebody will say in the comments, but uh, magnesium, magnesium bars, and it comes with a striker. These are old school, but they have been around for a long time and they work. Then again, you, you could possibly run out of this it's according to how much time you have. So we're talking about flint and steel. We're talking about the bow drill method. Those take skill. So if you're thinking toward inch bag, think about primitive survival. And that's really where it goes, because that's where it's sustainable. Uh, even though this is a massively large fair cerium rod, uh, this sooner or later, you're, you're going to run out if this is over years with use. 
uh, and also knowing about fatwood. Uh, you can find fatwood in, in a lot of pine and it's the sap that runs through the trees and you can get that and it's flammable. So it's a great fire starter. Uh, try to put some leaves and twigs together and they'll light. But you put some fat wood on there and it'll burn. And we just did a video on unusual ways to start fire. Um, so you've got those basic fire skills that you need to learn. You need to go out and try some fire, fire making skills. But again, guys, I love my lifeboat matches. Uh, and I would put them in my inch bag, but I'm not going to count on these because they'll only last as long as the matches last. And fire, again, it gives you light. It gives you heat. It cooks your food. It boils your water. It keeps uh, predators at bay. Having a fire kit is vital. Uh, and so for my standard fire kit for my bug out bag, sure, I'm going to have a big lighter in there. You can bet because this is easy. Or I'm going to have some matches. I'll have life broke matches. But I'll have those things because I'm only really planning on being three, four days and it's getting kind of thin on four days. So, uh, you know, that gives you some ideas about having long term fire starting capability. OK, so next is food. Now, food is going to be a tough one uh, or it can be a fairly easy one. It's according to where you are, uh, you know, having a couple of freeze dried meals from Mountain House is going to be good for a couple of days. But you're going to have to expand beyond that. So having a fishing kit and, you know, it was funny. I was where we were somewhere. I think um, we were Hobby Lobby of all places. And they had these little collapsible um, uh, fishing rods and they pulled out and it was really compact, really easy to use. And I thought that'd be a great idea to put in a bag, something small. But you can take a cane pole and put a, a monofil monofilament line on it. Or for that matter, you can take your paracord and you can pull out one of the strands and you can use it and you can fish with it. You can find bait. Uh, so fishing to me is one of the easier when it goes to hunting or gathering, uh, but also gathering. So foraging, uh, knowing what plants are edible in your area. That's a very important thing. Um, one thing that you could do would be a little heavy. And I think they maybe make some smaller versions, but uh, the SAS survival guide, uh, it has all kind of information in there that you could possibly use as a reference uh, when it goes to traps, having small traps, uh, you know, whether it's, I had one laying out here, I thought uh, a small little uh, rat trap, but they make some big mouse traps, uh, but also there are all kinds of different traps and you can do a deadfall trap, learn how to do those. You know, that's not a lot of protein and sometimes it's almost not worth the energy spent <laughs> for the little bit you get. But if you're hungry enough, it at least gives you a morale booster. Uh, so uh, traps and then hunting. Uh, one thing that I would highly recommend in an inch bag is a 22. Um, you know, you may have your sidearm. You're going to have information, you know, your ammunition stocked away and you should have really a rifle score to the situation. But having a good 22 is going to allow you to actually be a little quieter. And also you can pack more ammunition and it's a great hunting tool. So even with some of the pistols that are out there, they're excellent. It's small. Uh, you know, using some kind of 22 makes a great um, addition to your inch bag. And again, you can really stock up a lot of a lot of ammunition, but uh, there are a lot of places that carry 22 ammunition and you may be able to find some. Uh, so you may there may be an abandoned home that, you know, you can find some even there. So 22 to me is is the caliber. Now, is it a great self-defense caliber? It can kill, but it's not a great self-defense caliber. So, you know, having something on your side, obviously, um, and of course, me having the suits channel, I'm all about firearms for self-defense, but having a 22 to me in an inch bag is something that really is important before you start having to make a bow and arrow <laughs> and then try to do something. But that is another thing with hunting, uh, but also dumpster diving. You know, you can get around a community or somewhere, go over to the dumpster. If that community is still thriving, if you have no other options, it may be some place for you to find food. It's not very appetizing, but it will fill your stomach typically because we throw away a lot of food. Uh, and, but again, it's according to the situation. And then you have food banks. It's according again, it's according to what your situation is to where you're out on your own, but you can kind of be around some communities, a populated area to be able to glean a little bit of benefit in different ways. Um, and so one thing about the inch bag, again, is that while it is self-sustaining and contains what you need, uh, there are other items that you may be able to pick up along the way. 
And so that that's a possibility. Um, but you've got a plan that that's not the case. OK, we're going to go to one more and then we're going to go to some questions because I, you guys always have some good questions. Uh, but water, water is vital. You can only live three days without water. So water really is more on the top of the list, but water is a little bit easier to um, to purify. Uh, you know, you might have a nice filter. And here we have a Frontier filter straw. It has a, a filter. It'll do about 28 gallons of water. And this will get you started. This will get you going. Uh, you can pack extra filters. Very easy. So, you know, I can get a couple of hundred gallons of water if I pack it right. Or, you know, uh, Sawyer Mini. Uh, and then, of course, the uh, Katadyne Hiker Pro or the MSR series. There's a ton of different water filter systems out there. But they are reliant on the filter. And the filter can get filled up. So having other skills, um, obviously, if you're in the Boy Scouts, you know, it's, uh, you, you know, you use the natural elements where, you know, you take coarse gravel and then under that is um, sand, coarse sand. And then you go with uh, charcoal and then you go with fine sand. And then at the bottom you have a cloth and it just pours through there. And by the time it comes out, it's, it's clean because that's the way it works in nature in a sense, because the water, the rainwater comes and goes down and it is our drinking water. Uh, another way is to take a, a heavy meal trash bag, which I highly recommend having these in every bag you own, uh, a number of these, but put this uh, up and in the morning, the dew comes down and you can actually direct it to where it'll collect some water. Rainwater in different areas. Rainwater is, is a potable water, it's drinkable water typically. So, you know, as long as it hasn't been sitting, and so you can maybe after a good rain, which leads us to a container. You really need some sort of container. Now, if you get a large container, because water weighs eight pounds per gallon approximately. So having a good container, which is good for food, you're going to cook your food. And this one has a little cup. It's one of the Pathfinders. Uh, and this is a single walled uh, container. And so that way I can put this on the fire directly. I can boil things. If you have a double walled container, it can actually explode. So you don't want to do that. Uh, and then two, it's all metal. So I can put this, the cap has plastic on it, but I don't put that on the fire. And so I can actually boil water in this. I can cook in this. I can cook here. And again, having some sort of stove really helps. You can improvise a way to cook. You know, you can take sticks and all that. And, and two, it may come to that. But the one thing about this is it's really sturdy and I've got a handle. And so these are the kind of things that you want to pack away that will last a long time. This will last you for years. And so it's something that, you know, you want to uh, have put aside and utensils, uh, having a good, you know, spoon, knife and fork. Uh, but, you know, spoon is definitely the one that, you know, if you only had one or a spork, but they make a lot of different sets. You want a good quality set that's not going to bend. Uh, that holds up really well. I would not go with plastic, even though if I'm camping, I might go with plastic or if, even a three day bag. But when it comes to the inch bag, I want to have something that's really sturdy and a canteen, uh, a mess kit. Even, you know, you can use that for different things. And of course, obviously, a knife is going to be very important uh, around everything, whether you're a get home bag, bug out bag, whatever. Having a good fixed blade knife. This thing is huge. It's an SE, uh, SE6, I think. Yeah, it's SE6. It's huge. It's a fixed blade knife. I can do a ton of things with this. Knives are important. It even has a ferrocerium rod uh, here on the sheet. And so this gives me the ability to also create fire, which I can hunt my prey. And if I had to, I could wrap this with my paracord around a long straight stick and use it for, you know, a, a spear. So let's go to some questions. Oh. Has this been going on the whole time? Have I been way over there? Have y'all been able to hear me? I hope so. Okay. Okay. Sorry. Um, Keelan asked, question, Mike Glover realized or recently talked about a speed ball as a term for quick resupply for your team, water, ammo, food, meds. Where could we stash these so our families can access them and keep secure? Well, you know, geocaching is a big deal. And Mike Glover, I love Mike Glover. I love what he does. I've been to some of their survival training classes uh, here in our area. Uh, they do an awesome job. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, having supplies. Now, one thing about an inch bag is that you might not know which direction you're going. I mean, you may not have a, a destination. Uh, with a three-day get-home bag where you have a destination plan, that is an easier way to set up, uh, you know, resupplies like that. Uh, and of course, geocaching is a great thing. Now, you may not have the um, uh, 
a way to find it because, you know, electronics may be down and things like that. But having markers where you can plant things, um, you got to be careful where you because <laughs> you don't want to necessarily do it on public private land and then, ha you know, have somebody, you know, get yourself in some, a situation. But um, yes, I think that is a great way because number one, you don't have to carry it. It's already there and you have a destination to go to. So uh, especially ammunition, that's heavy. Uh, and then two, you may, of course, food and different items that are just desperately needed. Uh, one thing that we've done over the years, we have uh, what we call our cash and it's a um, storage unit. And me and one of my buddies in our prepper group, we store survival items in that it's off site. So if something were to happen here and I had to go and I could get to the storage unit, which is, you know, it's also a possibility is having a storage unit. It doesn't have to be big. You can put enough necessary items in there. Uh, it's usually private. And most of the time they're fairly secure. So we can get items out of there if we had to. But uh, yeah, I, that's a great um course is Mike. He's going to put together some great stuff. But yeah, I highly recommend that. Even in your yard, if you know your house is compromised, if you have a large enough uh, place where you can hide something back there and to be able to cover some of your bases in case you do have to leave. You know, if you get ran out of your house, uh, you may be able to come back at night and go to that area and and dig it up. And, you know, but here's the thing, guys, for that kind of stuff. Um, you know, Typically, things that happen start to start to ratchet up, it starts to ratchet up, ratchet up. When things start ratcheting up, that's when you start really putting together uh, some things that you wouldn't necessarily do that you think I would never need that uh, and then put it together. I had a good friend of mine that lives down in Honduras. And when he was um, uh, young, his uh, family had land, they had property and they had a socialist revolution. And one night a mob came to their house. They had a walled house and they had to evacuate their house to save their own lives. What they had though was a tunnel that went under their house. Now, some people now would go, why you got a tunnel? What the heck? Listen, guys, things happen. Things can happen. Uh, and so thinking about things through, uh, sometimes it may seem absolutely ridiculous, but in the moment, you're going to be glad you did. Um, L arms to ask, what about using lint from the dryer as far as fire starter? Great. Lint from the dryer is an excellent fire starter. One thing that we do is we take toilet paper rolls, stuff them with lint and then pour hot wax into those rolls. Uh, or you can even take, uh, the cosmetic pads. In fact, that's one of my favorites, this little thin wafer pads, and you can lay them out and you pour hot wax on them. And then you, when they dry, they're like these little wafers and you can pack them in bags and use them. Vaseline and cotton balls is also a good one. But yes, we did a whole video on dryer lint, uh, taking an egg carton, an empty egg carton and taking dryer lint and putting it in each of the places where the eggs are and then pouring wax over it. You can burn it as it is, but putting wax over it makes it a beautiful thing. <laughs> it just makes it a really great fire starter and it's cheap. You can get it for nothing. Uh, the wax is the only thing it's going to cost you, and you can use old candles if you want. Uh, Football Factory asks, are they NVC filters, the water filters? No, but I have some. Uh, I have some. Yeah, they. that's a difference. You, if, if there's a nuclear problem or biological issue, uh, this takes out a lot of heavy metals. It takes out uh, cryptosporidium, giardia, those things that can really not only make you sick, but kill you. But when it comes to a radiation, they do make adapters to these and they make adapters for a number of them. In fact, I had one in there. I started to pull it out. But yes, that is something. If there is a threat of nuclear war and listen, guys, here's the thing. Here, here we go. We're all like this on this level playing field. The awareness is not there. And as things start to ratchet up, people start doing this. When the public gets panicky, it's too late. Supplies will dry up just like we saw with toilet paper back in COVID. They'll dry up those things just like the gas on the East Coast when gas ran out. It took a day or two for people to start panicking, uh, which was great because it gave me an opportunity to go and fill up all my, my jerry cans. But watch for signs. Watch for signs. Let me tell you something, guys, and this is just straight up facts. There are cyber attacks on every county in the country, every county, multiple cyber attacks continuing to disrupt infrastructure, disrupt law enforcement, uh, dispatch, all these different things. And they are constant. It's just a matter of time before some of them hit, which they do. And you just don't hear about it. Uh, they hit a lot of local and county governments, which are affect you specifically. 
Uh, so if you're county government, the water system has been hacked and they, they're holding it for ransom and they've got a problem, you know, you're just out of water. So what we're talking about and with prepping and survival, guys, it is getting more and more important to be prepared. Uh, Stephen Swim asks, what are your thoughts on flexible collapsing containers for storing water and saving space? Yes. Uh, yeah. I mean, the space is the big deal. Space is the problem, uh, especially if you're a prepper and you're putting a lot of things together. Uh, we looked at some of those collapsible containers. We've been talking about it. Uh, and I think my buddy actually got some. Uh, so that is something that I think is a viable way uh, because for us, we've got the big 55 gallon drums, the blue drums, you know, and uh, barrels. And we use that for rain catchment, and some other things. And um, they're big and they stay in one place unless you have them filled up. So, yes, the only thing my only concern would be if it gets punctured, you know, is it sturdy enough uh, where if it was like in my garage and a shovel or something hit it, which should be OK. But that's my only concern. But, yeah, I think that's a great idea. OK, let's let's continue on. Uh, we've talked about um, well, we've talked about containers now. So containers now camouflage and camouflage is not, you know, um, you know, <laughs> your uh, woodland camo, or your tiger stripe, or, you know, even the marine camo current camouflage. Uh, camouflage is something that you blend in. You blend in to the environment. If you're wearing camouflage, traditional camouflage in an urban environment, you're going to stand out. And so you don't want to do that. Uh, you want to have something that blends in with what everybody else is wearing, uh, you know, and you want to move in that direction. Also, uh, you could be in a more rural area and you need to kind of hide. Well, there's some things that you need to think about with camouflage. It may be using natural materials like the military uses to cover up what you have. Could be a camouflage tarp or camouflage netting. Uh, so that is a, a possibility. The problem with a big camouflage net is it's heavy and tarps are heavy. So figuring out ways to think about it. If you're in that situation, camouflage is going to be important. But also think about it like this. If you're in that situation, it means that probably a lot of people are in that situation. Um, and so especially in a general area where you have to evacuate and there's a big area that, right there where a lot of people are having to leave, you know, chances are you're not going to stand out as much. But if you're all decked out in camo, you got a plate carrier on, you got your AR-15 or AK-47, you know, you could stand out. And then again, if it gets that bad, you may not. But again, clothing is going to be one of the important parts. Um, you know, like this uh, mystery ranch bag, you know, it's in the camouflage. It's 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 kind of subdued, so it's not too bad. But, you know, having something that'll be more of a gray man when you're moving through areas could be important. But let's face it, guys, we see homeless on the streets all the time, all the time. And, you know, you, you almost don't see them sometimes. Uh, so, you know, in a grid down type situation where you may have an inch bag, you may just be blending in because you're in the same condition everybody else is in. Uh, OK, medical. Medical is big, but medical is going to be one of those that's just going to run out if you have a lot of supplies. I mean, this is a trauma kit. This is excellent. We take these to the range. Uh, they have, you know, your cat tourniquets. They have uh, hydrostat or the uh, hemostatic galls and all the things you need. Uh, but training is important. But having supplies. You know, having some goals. The one thing about medical typically is you're not going to have to use it a lot or every day. So uh, being able to have some galls put back and some antibiotic ointments and wet wipes to keep you sanitary, or keep wounds clean, uh, protecting yourself, bandages, things like that. Because what you don't want is to have a small cut turn into infection and then turn into gangrene. And then, you know, it could actually take your life. Uh, so having medical supplies on hand, but just as important is getting skill to be able to use those medical supplies. So medical, big time, learning the basics, just taking a CPR class, getting some information is going to go a long way. Uh, OK, now this is a big one and it's barter. Uh, here's the thing, guys. If you are abandoning your home and maybe it's you don't have, you know, everything's just burn up. Your job's gone and you don't have any money. The banks are closed. You just there's nothing and you're left pretty much destitute except for things that you have around the house and you've got your inch bag, you're heading out. You're going to need some way of currency. Man has always used different items for currency and honestly, gold and silver. And we bring this up a lot, guys, but this is very important. Right now, the price of gold is the highest it's ever been in history, <laughs> in history. 
the history of man. Uh, it got up to two thousand and one hundred and ninety dollars. I think it was last week. Uh, it's at one seventy something right now. Uh, when I years ago, we were in the jewelry business. We made handcrafted jewelry. My family did. And gold was three hundred and twenty five dollars an ounce. So it, gold, the gold will retain its value. Silver, which is a little bit heavier to match the same uh, value of gold, is still a great item to have some silver coins uh, because people recognize silver. And a lot of times it's according to where you're going. Now, some people go, well, if the, you know, they're not why are they going to trade silver. Well, you know, you may have a shovel and uh, the guy wants it, but he doesn't have something you want. And so he can give you silver where you can give him the shovel and then you can take that shovel and go buy some, or that silver and go buy some chickens. And, you know, the thing is, is in any situation, it's going to be a new normal. It'll get back to some normal. It won't be normal as in the way we live, but it will be a normal. And when that normal comes, having some precious metals put back is going to be important because you can't carry enough barter items in your inch bag. You can't carry a bunch of extra knives and extra ammunition and things that you want to barter extra bottles of whiskey, <laughs> you know, whatever it is that you want to barter. This really contains it down and it gives it more of a, this is something that anybody can trade and buy and sell. It's what happened during the war the, uh, in Germany after World War II, when their economy just collapsed and people used gold and silver to barter and trade and other barter items, but they were still living in the community. Um, so yes, gold is the highest it's ever been right now. I highly recommend buying silver. Silver is about $25 an ounce, which it has gone up some, but guys, if it's, it's on a trend to go up and over the past couple of years, it's really just, it'll come down and up and down, but it keeps climbing that ladder. So, um, I can't recommend that enough. If you want to invest in gold, if you have investments or, or silver, then get in touch with Scott Stale Mint out of Arizona. I've known those guys for years. They are very trustworthy great people. Okay. Uh, and cash, having some cash because power can be down. And at first you could use some cash to be able to get it as long as the cash holds value. All right. Items found in nature, things that you have around, you know, we talked about shelters, but you can build a shelter. You can take old logs, especially if you have a good saw, like this silky saw. Uh, it's very compact, easy to use. It cuts like it cuts through wood, like butter. I love these saws a good ax or whatever. I would highly recommend a saw over an ax even because you can, you're not going to, you're not prone to hurt yourself with a, uh, with a saw. Uh, you can really injure yourself with an ax. So, but using items that are in nature, one thing is, and we talked about food and foraging, but the pine tree, the pine tree underneath is cambia. And if you take that, pull the bark off, it's that thin kind of stringy, a uh, whitish material underneath that is edible. <laughs> believe it or not. Uh, and, you, and we did a video about it. Uh, you can take that and you can actually grind it up. You can actually just cook it over or you can eat it like it is. I would recommend putting it in a frying pan. It's it's not the best, but it can be self life sustaining. And a lot of pioneers ended up using that. Also, you can take pine needles and boil them in water and it gives you vitamin C. So it gives you a way to be able to keep from having scurvy or whatever else can come around. And vitamin C is very vital. So Learning some things like that, using items that are in nature, uh, you know, mushrooms, you got to be careful unless you know what you're doing. Uh, but finding those items in nature, uh, taking rocks and building a rock shelter, you know, you could actually do that it's according to where you're where you are. But but taking the items in nature and being able to use them, uh, if you have a small shovel that you have attached, you could actually dig out an area. Uh, and so a lot of possibilities. But nature is, is, in fact, when man came to earth, that was all he had to start with. And he used the items of nature and then he built things all the way up to skyscrapers. And those are items that are found in nature. You got to have a backhoe to dig out <laughs> and some dynamite. Okay. Um, orientating or navigation. Uh, one thing that I would recommend, especially for your area is, and I recommend these all the time, is having a map. Having a map, and you can get the smaller the map, the more localized the map, uh, you know, the more detailed it'll be. But, you know, if you have to move out of that area, you, you might find yourself not having a map. Uh, this is actually a map of uh, the southeast, and it has a lot of different roads and things, and then having a good compass. Uh, but really, having a map, you're going to need to kind of know where you are if you can. 
Um, and it may not be vital to your inch bag. You may not, you may just be going, okay, I don't, it doesn't matter where we're going, but you may be able to avoid some situations. Batteries. That's another thing. Batteries are out. You're not going to have batteries. And even if you have a little battery backup and you can charge things, that's great for a three day bag. But for a really long term solution, um, solar is going to be good. If you can, if you can get a solar battery backup uh, here, communications, again, super vital, but they usually, they all rely on power. Uh, here we have a little, um, this is a Midland. It's just a little uh, emergency radio. And the cool thing about it is it has a solar panel on top and it has a uh, handle here. If I can, if I can figure out how to get it out. Uh, anyway, it has a crank on it. Here we go. And so I can just do this and I can charge it. I don't have to worry about batteries. There is a rechargeable battery in it, but if it goes bad, it goes bad. But this gives me some options and there's also light. So, you know, if my flashlights go out, I hate to have to use this, but I can. Weather is on here as well, Noah. Uh, so a good little small radio, uh, or you could use this to actually charge some things, but you've got to sit there and crank. But what else have you got to do? <laughs> so uh, don't be dependent on electronics because over a long term, they're just going to end up failing. So thinking about that through that now I've got a whole battery. I got my battery daddy full of batteries and that thing's heavy. So you don't want to really be lugging that around. Uh, and for a long term situation, uh, it's not going to be sustainable. Repairs. Uh, obviously, paracord is awesome. Um, you know, bank line, bank line's great stuff. Sewing kits, having sewing kits. You can have tears in your clothing. You can have problems. So uh, having some kind of sewing kit is going to give you some ability to be able to keep yourself. Because what the problem is, is if I tear here and it's a small tear, oh, well, that's not too bad. But then a limb catches it and it rips all the way down the arm. So um, you want to keep your clothes repaired and having a, a good sewing kit is vital. Uh, also with duct tape, things like that. But one thing is, is bailing wire or here we have some trip wire having some kind of wire to be able to use. Uh, that's going to come in handy. So think about a repair kit to put in your inch bag, because again, these are the items you have. You don't have anything else unless you kind of find it. And that's going to be luck of the draw. Let's go to some questions after this one. Um, so we're going to talk about sanitation. It's very important to keep clean, especially in a, a bad, uh, when you're out and, you know, there's no way to necessarily take good warm showers or whatever. Um, you know, you've got to just keep yourself clean. And sometimes it's going to just require you going down to the local uh, creek and just washing off, keeping your hands washed as clean as you can, um, keeping yourself clean. Of course, sanitary wipes are great, but they're only going to last so long. You know, if I pack this thing full of sanitary wipes, that may last me a good while, but I, I'm not going to, I won't have the other things that I need in there. One thing I do want to say about this too is, is that when you are doing your bag, it is a early bug out bag. You do have some food items. You do have some things in there that are going to get you started. Uh, one thing that I've always said is one thing about prepping is it's not an end all, but it'll give you some time. It'll buy you time. Uh, if you want to go to an end all, if you really want to be prepared, uh, then you want to get into homesteading and homesteading is a great way, uh, especially with them talking about, you know, us eating bugs. And now they're talking about us eating pythons. So, Having a way to be able to create your own food, uh, sustain yourself, have livestock, whatever you can have, uh, is a, a smart move as far as the end of prepping. So, but prepping itself is going to give you, it's going to buy you time. And that's the big plus. All right. What do we got? Uh, L. Arms to ask, what is the name of that huge knife and where did you purchase it? Essie. Essie, one of the best production knives out there. Uh, this is the SE6. They make the S, they make the Azula, which is little. And I've got one of those, the four. It's great. I mean, they have different styles. And then SE makes other knives. These are solid. They have a really nice spine on them. Uh, they'll take a they have a good sharp edge right here. So I can light my fire steel. And uh, this one has my card of scales. And I think that's what they typically do. A lot of times they have their own sheath. I got this sheath. I don't know, eBay, Amazon, somewhere, uh, just because I thought it was kind of cool, but it's heavy. So there's a lot of different things, but SC knives are some are really excellent knives as far as just a, a good solid knife. And, but here's the thing, guys, you have a good knife and you want to have some kind of sharpener. And that's one thing that I want to just mention is when you have a knife, 
you need a sharpener, especially if it's an inch bag. You don't necessarily need that for a three-day bag, but you do need it for an inch bag. Uh, Rob G asks, what about eye protection? Yes, well, eye protection is important, you know, and especially if you're in outdoors a lot, having sunglasses or some kind of, uh, you know, uh, safety glasses. Um, but, you know, uh, yes, that's a, that's a smart move, having some kind of eyewear, eye protection, because you lose an eye and then there you go. And it's all fun and games until somebody loses an eye. <laughs> uh, Patches B asks, what company do you to purchase metals from? Scottsdale Mint is my, I've known those guys for years. I, I trust them. Um, and they're good. They're good people. I've known uh, Josh for 12 years and uh, they, they mint coins for over 20 countries worldwide. So they're, they're a serious mint. They're not just a broker house. Um, and I, I really like them, uh, what, but I'll tell you a couple of other options. Uh, one thing that I do a lot because I like to buy some junk silver. I like it because it's face value. It's a quarter or it's 50 cent or it's even a silver dollar. People look at it and they know what it is. They immediately know that's silver and, you know, there's there's value to it. Uh, so there's a place up in town called Upstate Gold here in Greenville. And I'll go up there and I'll say, hey, I want this much silver or I want gold or I want whatever. And I can just buy it and then I can take it and put it back. So to me, that's or pawn shops a lot of times, auctions, estate auctions. And it, it's according to when they come through. Sometimes I remember going to, we used to do a lot of state estate auctions. And um, there would be times where somebody had died and they had all these coin, all this silver. And so they would sell them in bag lots. And uh, you could get them actually for a decent price. But, uh, and I'll just be honest, eBay. You can go on eBay, know what your values are. Know that, you know, a uh, a quarter, a silver quarter is this much if I go to the pawn shop. So can I get it here? Gun shows, flea markets. A lot of places have silver. I bought silver at gun shows and flea markets. <laughs> so, you know, picking up a little bit at a time, guys, you don't have to go and spend $20,000 on uh, precious metals, but it does divest your wealth. And you can always take it and go, if you never use it, you can take it and you can resell it or you can put it on eBay and get, you know, top dollar for it. So, um, except for the little fees, but it, to me, that's a great way to do it. Um, Rob G asks, lots of things are edible, but can you stand the taste? Well, and can your stomach stand it? You know, we're used to eating processed food or whatever we eat. Uh, you start switching your diet. It can be tough. It can be tough. Um, so, you know, it's one of those things where you're just going to have to figure it out. Um, and if you're that hungry, you know, there's not a lot of other options. Uh, dumpster diving is not to me the most appetizing, but really that's closer to what you're going to be eating on a, or have been eating on a normal basis than going out in the woods and stripping cambia off of a pine tree and eating it. Um, or, you know, even kudzu roots are edible. You make a flower out of it. A lot of things out there, guys, that we've, uh, cattails, uh, cattails that are in the, in your um, uh, ponds, the, those are edible. Dandelions, wild onions, wild onions are, are edible. Uh, of course, you know, blackberry bushes, things like that. I mean, there's a lot of stuff out there, but here's the one thing to remember that in a grid down situation where a lot of things are going on, a lot of that stuff is going to be foraged already. Um, you know, during uh, the depression, uh, we almost lost the deer population because people were going out and they were hunting because they had no food. So a lot of things. But, you know, one thing is, is again, to get more, if you're really interested in the inch bag and the possibilities around that, I would really start looking into older type remedies and things that people did back in the 1800s, how they did their food, what they did with it, how they processed it, what were they eating? and a lot of the things that they, they use. So um, one thing that we do is I'll try to buy tools that are that do things that we've kind of gone to mechanical now, but now we can use mechanical, you know, you can use your standard tools instead of electric. And, uh, and I just have them put back. If I need something, I pull out my cordless drill. I mean, you know, but uh, if I didn't have that and I needed to drill something, I do have some of the mechanical drills uh, where I can do some things. So having a few of those tools put back is just a direction to go in.
Uh, Jason Durham asks, starting with lower income level, thoughts on waiting and saving for better hardware items, knives, et cetera, or get what you can now? Um, yeah, that, I mean, the, here's the thing. Um, as far as like for me going out and buying something like this, if I, if I was on a limited budget, uh, I wouldn't, I'd go buy something else. Uh, I'd go buy a Mora knife. Mora knives are excellent. They're fishing knives from Scandinavia and, uh, they're, 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 excellent knives they're kind of small but they are really great little knives they run about 10 bucks they're just really well known in the survival community uh, so i would i would do something i mean i would not do anything and wait because what are you going to do when you get to that point then you spend it on something that's maybe a little bit major purchase and then you don't have the other things you need uh, for me as far as in prepping goes what i would do is is first think about food food and i would go to the grocery I would take, if I only had $5, $10 left over on my check, I would buy some rice and beans, maybe a couple of cans of food. And then I would say, okay, I'm ahead, more ahead today than I was yesterday. And then just kind of build that up a little bit, build up things on a slow basis. Go to flea markets. You can find great items. Go to the um, thrift stores. We, uh, Sarah Mack and I went to a thrift store. We did a whole video on it, how to find survival items. And I told her, I said, oh, it'll probably take about three or four trips. We had so much stuff that first trip. We had a buggy full of stuff. We even had one of the Berkey sport water filters that was there. That was new. It was just sitting over there. Boots, jackets, you know, uh, candles, all kind of stuff. You name it, they had it. So, and of course, it's according to where you are. But you can do a budget. Another thing is, have a, have a yard sale, have a yard sale. Spring's coming. When spring gets here, people start having yard sales or go to yard sales and find things for very reasonable prices. So there are a lot of options out there for the budget minded. Listen, guys, when I first started my channel and you can go back because it's been 16 years now, when I first started my channel and I did budget options, I mean, that's all I had. I didn't have a lot of money. And so I was doing whatever. I mean, <laughs> military surplus. I was go I went to this one place and the girl was a, a, a mountain climber and she had tents and all these, all this stuff. She's just selling at a yard sale for pennies on the dollar. And I bought a number of things. So um, you can find things. In fact, I still have a headlamp that I got from her. It's a Petzl, but it was a nice one and it still works. And it's, you know, it's, I just have it. So um, build up. I would, I would at least do something. One of the things that for foul down in Argentina, when they had their economic collapse, you know, he did, he, it was just like, boom. And he was like, what am I going to do? He had a Rambo survival knife. Those things are cheap. They're made of pop metal. They have a little container on the end, have a compass and, and they're just cheap. He said that got me through the whole ordeal. He said, it was just amazing. I had this as a kid. I used it. I used it for a lot of different things. So I wouldn't get too caught up on a normal survival prepping idea. If you're going with an inch bag, you've kind of stepped over the preparedness you kind of you, you've got some things put back for preparedness inch bag is is something that you really need durable items but honestly a good fairly inexpensive buck knife fixed blade knife and you get a stone and you can just sharpen it it'll get you through uh you don't that's one thing we've gotten in the mentality of is having oh well then i need i need this pelican first aid i rock you know 130 dollar no you don't need that you don't need that and uh, and I need my mystery ranch. Now, this is a great bag and it's, I mean, built like a tank. But there are other options out there if you're on a budget. Sorry to go on a rant there, but I, I understand that. I understand that very much. Um, John G asks, do you have a preference, SE4 versus SE5? Um, I like the SE4 because it's, it is more compact. It's easier to use. It's easier to, man, to, to maintain. But the reason I got the SE6, which I have an SE4, uh, the reason why I have this one uh, and bought it was because I can baton. I can do so much with this and definitely use it for a self-defense option if I need to. Uh, but full tang is one thing. It's really smart to use, get a full tang knife. Uh, but I, I got it because, you know, it's not that much bigger, but it gives me a lot more capability. My SC4, I've got it in there, and I think it's in, no, it's in my go bag now. It's in my get home bag. Uh, but for this situation, I would probably build for my inch bag, I would probably go with the six inch because I'd want something that could handle a array because I'm going to have a pocket knife. 
I'm going to have a smaller knife to be able to do some things. But for uh, a big knife, and this has a sharpening stone in this pouch. Again, sharpening stones, way to sharpen your knives is going to be vital uh, because knives get dull. And when you're out there, they get dull quickly. Um, Patches B asks, do you feel a solid barrier around your home in the suburbs makes sense? Um, one thing that happened, again, in Argentina, and the reason why I bring up Argentina is because uh, Fafal wrote a book of actual events that happened that we we're looking at. It was an economic collapse uh, and chaos ensued. It was crazy. And the, and the peso went to zero. Uh, and gold and silver were important during that time. But, um, you know, we, we live not way out. We live, we live out, but we have houses around us. And um, we had looked at a piece of property. And, well, actually, we're looking at a piece for a compound. But we, we were looking for a piece of property, maybe to sell our house and move way out. The problem with that is, is unless you have people with you to keep security, uh, you're very vulnerable. Uh, you're not quite as vulnerable in a group, uh, a, a road where you have people that live around you that, and especially if you get to know them and in a grid down situation, you'll get to know them. They'll, they'll start to go, Hey, you know, let's think about some things. So uh, having those people together, listen, people are your number one asset when it comes to survival, hands down people, unfortunately back, especially during the seventies and eighties with the survival movement really came on. Uh, it was like lone wolf. This is my stuff. Nobody gets it. I understand that because I work hard for my stuff. But on the other hand, having someone that can go out and process wood for cutting, doing different things, people are going to be and security specifically are going to be very vital to you. Uh, do you want to people? Do you want to stock up all of this food for you and your family and somebody come and take it? No, you don't want to do that. But uh, there's a balance. So. Um, uh, Suburban is according to how close you are to the city. And if you're near a major city, I would really look at doing something different. For me, if I was on the suburbs of any major city in the country, uh, I would be looking for a retreat area because it's going to spill out. And guys with the elections coming, either way, doesn't matter. Uh, you know, mainly if, if Trump wins, it's going to be chaos in the cities. Uh, if, uh, if Biden wins, then the right is going to be looking at it as in y'all have stole the election for the last time. I'm just telling you the mindset. And there's already been rumblings on the right for that. So, you know, we could be facing about November, some serious situations. So being in the city, I would consider during election season toward there, toward the end, I would consider relocating at least temporarily. Uh, if you live in the city, I'd go see my, my brother, brother-in-law. I keep saying my brother-in-law. I'd go see family members or friends and stay for a couple of days and watch and see what happens. That's just my thoughts. Nothing may happen. But honestly, uh, with the um, the polarization right now in the U.S., uh, I'm, I'm a little concerned about that. For me, I'm not concerned about it here because we, I don't really think we're going to have any kind of issues. But again, if you live in a really urban or even a suburban area, you could face some things. Okay, guys. Um, the one thing that I didn't quite get to, because it's one o'clock, the one thing I didn't get to quite was planning. But planning, obviously, that's what you're doing when you're watching this. You're thinking about the different areas. The key, again, to inch bag is the durability and the sustainability. Get home bag, bug out bag. That's just going to get you to where you need to go. Inch bag, you may not have a place to go. And you're going to have to depend on your own survival skills and, and knowledge and, and luck of the draw or blessings from God himself, you know, which is definitely a huge part of this whole thing uh, is, you know, we can get you through that way, uh, is that you need items that, again, that you're going to be able to hunt. You're going to be able to re get resources. And, uh, and develop those. That is probably the biggest deal with the inch bag. Again, guys, thanks for coming in and, and checking it out. We're, we're going to be doing again an inch bag. I'm going to set up my inch bag and I'm going to show it on video. So hopefully it'll give you some ideas, but hopefully this gets you started thinking. And uh, in everybody's bags, whether it's bug out bag, get home bag, day bag, get, you know, backpack to go camp and whatever is they're all different because we have certain specific things we like. But it's great to be able to glean some ideas and some thoughts and to get you thinking. And that's really what I'm here for. Uh, we really appreciate Sarah Mack for being over on the uh, watching the questions and getting those out to me and helping set up everything. Uh, and I guess 
uh, next week. Robbie Wheaton will be here, I'm sure. But um, as you know, things are a little bit wonky. So put together your stuff. If you don't need it, it ain't going to hurt anything. But if you do, it's going to be worth its weight in gold. Be strong. Be of good courage. God bless America. Long live the Republic.